Roundtable panel brought to you by the Controllers Council. My name is Neil Brown, Executive Director of the Controllers Council. And before I introduce our expert panelists and our partner sponsor, let me share some brief housekeeping items. First, we'll have Q&A at the end of the presentation, so please use your GoToWebinar control panel to ask our experts questions. Next, this webinar will have with CPE eligible with four polling questions, so please answer three of four polls for CPE or answer to benchmark your peers. Please allow one week for CPE uh, certificates. Also regarding CPE, there'll be a brief survey directly after the webcast today, so please complete. And finally, you'll receive a link to this webcast via email in the next 24 hours, so no need for notes or screenshots. With that, I'm pleased to introduce our partner and sponsor, Citroen Cooperman one of the nation's largest professional service firms and the 19th largest CPA accounting firm in the U.S., also ranked 28th largest technology consulting firm in the U.S. by accounting today. Citrin Cooperman Digital Services include Microsoft, NetSuite, Salesforce, Vena, Cybersecurity, and more. Citrin Cooperman is headquartered in New York City with offices nationally. Here's our agenda. First, I'll uh, introduce our panelists. And as mentioned, we'll have polls uh, sprinkled throughout. Then we're gonna cover uh, four budgeting types and tips, followed by eight annual planning best practices, and uh, how to plan right, uh, 11 key steps, some common challenges in budgeting and planning, and uh, Last but not least, the financial dashboard best practices along with examples. Oh, and by the way, as mentioned, we will have uh, audience Q&A. So with that, I'm very pleased to introduce our esteemed panelists, Larry Diamond as Chief Financial Officer, CFO of Citroen Cooperman. Prior roles included Global CFO for Engine, Bloomberg Media, IPG, which I know uh, from the industry is in a public uh, group. And interestingly, uh, SVP finance for Martha Stewart Brands. Maybe we can talk about that, just maybe, or maybe not. Uh, uh, Dominic, uh, also Dom, uh, known as Dom DiBernardo, is partner and CPM practice leader at Citroen Cooperman. Prior roles included CEO, Chief Business Intelligence Officer, Operations Director, Financial Analyst, and data analysts. Larry and Dom, welcome. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, Neil. Uh, so with that, uh, we are gonna just get to our first poll. And uh, so let me load that up. And we'll launch. So we're gonna do this first poll so we get kind of a, a radar of, of uh, our attendees. Is budgeting and forecasting in your company manual, automated, or a combination? Please select one of the following. So again, a reminder, use your GoToWebinar control panel and uh, answer three of four polls. Give you a few seconds to answer that. And we'll take some notes on, on the answers uh, to refer, as we'll be talking about uh, this aspect as well. All right, so almost everyone's voted. So let's uh, just take a quick look at the results here. 51% manual, only 5%, uh, 100% automated, uh, and a good... Uh, portion 43% a combination of manual and automated so so interesting and that will lead us into our budgeting types so 
Great. Well, I'm going uh, go to, and, yeah, I'll hand it over to you, Tom. There you go. Thanks, Neil. Um, so go ahead and jump in. And, and to be honest, the, uh, the polling results aren't uh, all that surprising that there's still a lot of manual work going in, even with the ones that indicated that there was a, an automation component to it. There's probably, um, you know, technology has been deployed, but maybe not fully utilized yet. So what, what I'd like to do is jump in here with Larry and we'll, we'll talk about, you know, some of the, the basics when it comes to budgeting types and we'll, we'll get a little deeper as we get through the presentation here or the, or the discussion. Um, and, and really, I think it fundamentally starts at, at number one on the list, which is, you know, top down versus bottom up budgeting. Um, and the way I like to look at it, you know, I've, I've been in the seat running finance teams uh, before and I'll have Larry opine here in a moment is, you know, top down is really a budget that's been dictated from, you know, leadership down to the, to the ranks or budget owners across the organization, where I look at bottom up budgeting as being more collaborative. Um, and there's different components of, of that here in, in a moment. But what I love to, you know, kind of turn the tables over here to, to Larry and have him opine um, in terms of, you know, do you find one more effective than the other? Um, and, you know, how have you used, you know, one or both of those in, in your career and maybe even currently at Citroen Cooperman? Yeah, it's a great question, Dom. And, and first, I just want to say uh, for anyone who's kind of wondering about my participation in this call that I'm both the CFO of Citroen, but I also happen to be a client of Dom's uh, within the company. So some of the information we'll be talking about later will be relevant to that. Um, you know, look, over my career, I've worked for publicly held companies and I've worked for startups and I've worked for everything in between. And what I'll say about this is, you know, often the most efficient ends up with something that has a combination of these, but starts with some type of top down definition, because I think otherwise, if it's purely bottoms up, um, you know, there's generally an owner, whether it be shareholders and you're, you're managing to Wall Street expectations or an owner or in our case, private equity owners or management team. If you rely purely on bottoms up, I think people sort of view that as let me put forward my wish list. And that does um, you know, get some creative thinking. But I think you sort of have to stop. You know, the management team has to have an expectation of what the top down would look like. And I think that creates a little bit of efficiency and frankly, maybe eliminates a little bit of frustration in having people submit budgets in a pure bottom up way and then having management come back to them and say, hey, the pieces just aren't adding up. Everyone has to cut or it has to be um, different. So I really think the two things sort of have to come together. But I would suggest that if you're, you know, if you're on this call as part of the management team, that your management team have an idea of where you want things to end up and you somehow communicate that, whether that be in terms of individual division goals, um, or at least knowing, you know, as pieces start coming in, where you need to end up to make the budget right for your your leadership and your owner's expectations in coming years. Yeah, and no, to totally get the uh, the expectations and you know uh, different stakeholders. Um, one 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 just deeper question there before we touch on a few of the other items on the list is. Do you find, because in, in my experience, I, I found this to be true, but by, you know, having that bottoms up, even if it is, you know, tampered or gut checked with, you know, the expectations from the top or, or from ownership that you drive, when you, when you drive a budget process that's bottom up, that's collaborative, that you actually have a stronger, um, you know, ability to keep people accountable, um, you know, uh, for the budget that they participated in, you know, creating. Yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I think these things, it's its not one or the other. I think, you know, a, a, a divisional goal can be give, given from the top, but then within the division, uh, it's really about that group working together to say, how do we make our part of the goal? Um, so I do think that there ends up being a bottom up process, but it's like it's towards a, a, sp a specific goal. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, when you when you go from number one to number two here, you know, going from top down versus bottom up, you know, most organizations are probably in the camp that you you kind of described in, in terms of using both. Um, then there's this there's this uh, question you have to ask yourself, do you want to be zero based or do you want more traditional budgeting? And you know, the way I would define zero based or traditional for the for the audience here is zero based. Is you start with a blank slate and you have to justify, you know, the spend every year. It, it causes you to, you know, question the spending versus just accepting it as as a default versus you know, I would say traditional budgeting, you, you precede the, the budget with either the prior year results, the prior year budget or, or something like that. So what would you, from your experience, what have you found more effective? What are you using today? And, and maybe even why you choose one or the other? Yeah, um, so <laughs> this is another question where I'm gonna take both sides of the coin and say, you know, I think there are certain groups. So when I think about uh, creating a budget across 
uh, companies of different scales is sort of what I would call the, you know, the revenue producing side of the business, how, whatever type of business you're in and the organization that creates that revenue. And then there are the more central services. And I think for the revenue producing side, traditional budgeting makes sense, right? You know your starting point, you know what your churn in customers is, you know what your product mix is, and you're thinking a lot about either new products you're introducing, products you're gonna phase out, changing in product pricing, things like that. So I think traditional budgeting works well for those groups. For more central services, I do as a CFO often like to challenge them to take a more zero-based approach. So an example would be like a marketing department or a technology department. I think in terms of technology, there's your basic technology that helps the company run, but then there's also the need to invest in technology and to do things differently. And so that may require a very different mix of technology spend. And part of that is also, of course, supporting the revenue side of the business. And similar with marketing, I think if you just go back and say, hey, we're gonna employ the same marketing techniques we always have and tweak them up or down, you're missing um, kind of the conversations with the business about what's working, what's not working, and are there new things we should try? So that's kind of how I divide thinking about what part of the business is more zero-based versus more traditional. Yeah, you know, one of the things actually I thought was a good segue that you mentioned about, you know, the operational or the revenue generating side of the business when it comes to item number three on our list around, you know, driver-based planning, because I feel like that's one area where, you know, you, you do have a better handle on on customer churn and other other metrics uh, that, you know, maybe you're in a professional services firm like Sitchin Cooperman is, you know, billing rates or yields or things like that that are going to act as good drivers because we have a good long history of things. So when it comes to driver-based, uh, and, and I'm, I'm gonna bucket in here predictive budgeting as well, because I'd love to see if you have any stories in terms of when you take driver-based planning to the extreme um, and use you know, these fancy, fancy words like you know, um, predictive analytics and you know, uh, you know, the, these natures where you have a model that can forecast your budget for you. I'm curious, like, where do you draw the line in terms of a driver-based you know, kind of part of the plan um, and getting into predictive planning and, and how does it actually, you know, serve the organization? Yeah, I think it's a great question. I think, you know, I'm a strong believer in that the budget should come down to simple economics that everyone in the organization can understand and, could, and can build towards. And so I think driver based really fits in well with that. And, you know, I had one experience where I was with a startup and, you know, there were literally three or four drivers that were going to make our difference every year and whether we got additional funding to continue to, to uh, grow the business. And we literally, you know, took sort of a, a business card and put those four metrics on, you know, taped to everyone's computer, sort of an old fashioned method so that people would really think, how is what I'm doing helping to drive those metrics? On the other side, I'd say on the predictive budgeting, you know, I once had a head of fp a who I sort of called the mad scientist. And he was a brilliant guy, but he went overboard in my mind with like building a high, you know, a, a, a regression model and whatnot. But once he created all this sort of science behind where the budget should be, from a top level, we looked at it and it really didn't make sense relative to kind of where where our history of our of our business was. I think when you think about predictive, you really have to think about the things that in general you can get buy-in from across your organization. Um, and, and generally to me, like driver-based is, is easier to do that with. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think I think what we're, we're seeing is a common thread here before I close on, on item number four for the slide is that it's not really one or the other. It's a combination of a tool set that's available to you in planning. And, and, and it's likely you're going to use one or multiple different components and, and and depending on whether you're planning for as Larry described it as you know the shared services part of the organization that supports you know the revenue operation side or you're planning on the revenue re revenue operation side you're going to use a combination of of all of these things likely or, or at least some of them not one one in, in uh, substitution for the other yeah no I completely agree and I think it's more a case of if you're the person responsible for budgeting understanding what these means and how they apply and it may change year to year based on where you are in your company's life cycle or growth cycle or something like that yeah and then just closing on this side before we move to the next one you know I think you know this all of this rolls in you know, you put a budget together and and then you have you know this idea of you know you have your static budget which might be your annual plan that doesn't change throughout the year but then you have this rolling forecast. Uh, you know, you update things as things change, as as you actualize, you know, the budget, um, or as you do acquisitions. If you're a very acquisitive company, you know, you you may actually be changing your budget. Maybe that that idea of a static budget doesn't hold true when you're 
um, you know, constantly acquiring new companies. But maybe Larry, from your perspective, you know, what where do you draw the line in terms of you know, do you fix a budget in time and then you know start moving into a rolling forecast that's gets just kind of an update to the budget based off of the current business situation, or what does that look like to you? Yeah, no, I think my practice has always been to maintain some level of rolling forecast and it doesn't necessarily have to change every month, but at a couple times during the year. And I think one key reason as a CFO to do that is just to understand for cash flow management, for other things outside of just simply hitting the budget, right? It's just, it's sort of the broader financial and economic things. The other thing is, I've, regardless of the size of business or the time of, that I've worked in, you know, businesses change, things change, the environment changes, the economy changes, COVID happens, all kinds of things happen. And so I think while you may have a budget that everyone may be held accountable to, updating and understanding where you are, you really need that so you can make business decisions of as things happen to you, what are the you know um, proactive steps you're gonna take as a leader and as a manager to change the business to react to that. Yeah, I always think it makes me think back to a to a prior company I worked for. The 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 CEO there always said that you know no plan survives the first day of battle, um, but the you know the budget gives you a blueprint to uh, to navigate the next year. And then, as you said, that that rolling forecast nature allows you to be nimble and agile and, and you know kind of move with the the speed of which your business is changing and the dynamics and variables are changing. So, no, that's great. Appreciate your input there. Um, and maybe we go to the next slide here and talk a little bit about. Um, you know, annual best, you know, annual planning best practices. So if we, if we move, you know, back to just, you know, we're, we're in that time of 